So welcome to the course SJPHY1 B01 Mechanics 1. The contents of this course is taken from an introduction to mechanics by Kluckner and Kolenko. We will continue to discuss topics from chapter 2 Newton's Laws. In the last class we discussed about gravitational force. Today let's talk about electrostatic force. So as you are already aware, the electrostatic force Fb on charge Qb due to another charge Qa which is at a distance r is given by the famous Coulomb's law which states that the electrostatic force is proportional to the product of charges Q and Q, Qb and square of inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So the proportionality can replace with a constant k which is 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught where epsilon naught is a permittivity of free space whose value is 8.85 into 10 to the power minus 12 coulomb square divided by newton meter square then according to coulomb's law the force fb equal to k into q a q b by r square r a b cap where r a b cap is a unit vector in the direction from charge A to B. And just like the gravitational force, if you divide the force with the charge which is experiencing the force, then you get the, the corresponding field. So field is given by Fb by Qb which is K into Qa by R square Rab cap. Or in general, if you have a charge then the field due to that charge at a distance r is given by k into q by r square r cap. This is known as the electrostatic field. As I said earlier, a field can store energy and momentum and it becomes very important when we talk about light because the energy of light is stored in the electric and magnetic fields of the electromagnetic radiation. So whenever light interacts with any matter, it is this field which is transferring energy onto the material. Let's now talk about another type of force known as contact force. So these are transmitted between bodies by short range atomic or molecular interactions. And the examples of contact force include force of a string which is also known as tension then there is frictional force which acts against the motion and whenever there is a body moving through a fluid there is viscous force which once again is a resistive force so these are some of the examples of contact forces and the origin of these forces can be explained in terms of the fundamental properties of matter like their atomic structure or molecular orientation etc but we are not getting into the details of their microscopic origin. What we are interested in is how to incorporate them into our equation of motion so that we can have a more comprehensive analysis of the system under study. Let's first talk about the first type of contact force which is tension or force of a string. So consider a block of mass M in free space which is pulled by a string of mass small m. The force F is applied to the string as shown in the figure. Imagine that you are pulling the string towards the right. So that is the force here. Now the question is what is the force that the string transmits to the block? Whether the string transmits the entire force onto the block or will there be some loss? Now, how to analyze this system? Remember the methodology. First, identify the forces. Second, draw the force diagram. Third, write down the equation of motion. Fourth, if there is any constraint equation possible, write down that as well. Fifth, write down the equation using Newton's third law. Now you have enough equation. Remember the thumb rule. Number of question should be greater than or equal to the number of unknowns. Once you satisfy this condition, you can solve the system comfortably. So what are the forces here? The, the string is going to exert a force onto the block and in turn the block will exert a force back onto the string. Right? So let's call F1 be the force of the string on the block and F1 prime be the force of the block on the string. 
Let A be the acceleration of the block and A S be the acceleration of the string. So this is the force diagram. So let's write down the equation of motion for the string as well as the block. And for the block, the only force acting is F1, which is towards the right, which is a positive force. So left hand side is F1, which is equal to M into acceleration AM. Coming to the string, there are two forces acting. F acting in the positive right direction, F1 prime acting in the negative left direction. So the left hand side is F minus F prime, which is equal to M into AS. Coming to the constraint equation, if the string is inextensible, then since the string is attached to the mass, both the mass and the string will move with the same acceleration, right? So let me call AS equal to AM as A. So this is the constraint equation. And from Newton's third law, I know that the force exerted by string onto the mass and the counter force both have to be equal. So F1 equal to F1 prime. So now I have four equations, then I have three unknowns or two unknowns. So this is a straightforward business. So what you do, you can add these two equations. Since F1 equal to F1 prime, these two cancel. So I have F equal to M in MA plus small MA or acceleration A equal to F divided by M plus M. Substitute for A in one of these equations, you can do it for the first equation, then you get F1 equal to F1 prime equal to capital M divided by capital M plus small m into F. So this factor M divided by M plus M, this is obviously less than 1. So the force on the block is less than the force applied. In other words, the string does not transmit the full applied force onto the body. So theoretically this is fine, but practically we know that the, the mass of the string is negligible. So for all practical purpose, this factor m divided by m plus 1 can be approximated to 1. So unless the string is very heavy, the entire force will be transmitted onto the object. Now what is the meaning of tension here? So we can think of a string as composed of short sections which impact with each other by contact forces. So you can divide this string into a number of small sections and each section pulls the sections on either side of it and by Newton's third law gets pulled by the adjacent sections. Right? So if you look here, if you look at this section, so it pulls the section A with a force F and in turn experiences a counter force F in the opposite direction. Similarly, onto the section B, it exerts a force F prime and in turn gets pulled by an equal and opposite force. So the magnitude of the force acting between the adjacent sections is known as the tension. Okay. Now, although a string may be under considerable tension, if the tension is uniform, the net string force on each small section is zero. Okay. So you can see here, these two forces are equal and opposite, same story here. So these two cancel, so the net force on the string is zero. So the sections remain at rest unless external forces act on. So if you look at uh, the string of a guitar, if you tighten it, we know that the guitar string is under tremendous tension. But since there is no external force acting on it, the string doesn't move. Unless you apply an external force using your hand, the string is not going to move. Right? Because all the internal tensions of various sections, they cancel each other. So if there are external forces on the section or if the string is accelerating, then the tension is no more a constant, it varies along the string. So I can illustrate this with an example here. Consider the case of a dangling rope, a hanging rope. A uniform rope of mass M and length L hangs from the limb of a tree. What is the tension at a distance X from the bottom? So this is the bottom. At a distance x from the bottom, what is the tension? 
let's first find out what are the forces acting on this uh, rope so there will be a tension acting in the upward direction and the tension is not going to be uniform because there is an external force weight acting in the downward direction so let me define tension as a function of the height x so i call it as t of x then what is the weight acting in the downward direction weight is mass into gravity i know that total mass is m total length is l so mass per unit length is m by l so unit length has a mass m by l so what is the mass of length x m by l into x so if this is the mass then the corresponding weight is mx by l into g so this is the force derived diagram and there is no vertical movement of the rope so acceleration is zero which means i can write down the equation of motion as total force which is t of x in the upward direction minus mgx by l this is the weight in the downward direction equal to mass into acceleration since acceleration is zero right hand side is zero or t of x tension as a function of x equal to mgx by l so clearly you can see that as x varies the tension also varies so that's why we said if there are external forces on the section then the tension on the string varies along the length okay now let's put the limiting values here at the end of the rope at this point this is the starting point x equal to 0 so when you substitute for x equal to 0 you get tension equal to 0 so at the free end of the rope there is no tension what about the top point at the top point x equal to l so l l cancel you have t equal to mg so at the top of the rope tension equals the total weight of the rope now this is the case of a rope where an external force is acting now let's talk about the second case if the string is accelerating what happens to the tension so let's take the case of a whirling rope or a rotating rope imagine uh, a uniform rope of mass m and length l is pivoted at one end it is fixed at one end and rotates with uniform angular velocity omega what is the tension in the rope at a distance r from the, the fixed point? You can neglect the effect of gravity. So it's difficult to uh, calculate the total tension on the entire rope. So what we do is we will choose a small section, calculate the tension. And once you do that, you can either do a summation or an integration and calculate the tension on the entire system. So this is a common practice in physics. So we are going to take a small section between uh, distance r and r plus delta r. So what is the length of the segment? r plus delta r minus r, which is delta r. Now what is the corresponding mass of this section? We know that total mass is m, total length is l. So mass corresponding to a length of delta r is going to be m by l into delta r. Now because of the circular motion, there are going to be two types of acceleration. One is a radial acceleration, one is a tangential acceleration. But clearly there are no tangential forces acting on the system. We know that tension always acts along the radial direction. So even if you write down the equation of motion in the tangential direction, since the left hand side is zero, you are going to get a trivial equation which is of not much use to us. So let's focus only on the, the radial equation. So here there is a radial acceleration, therefore the forces pulling either end of the section cannot be equal. In other words, tension varies as a function of R. Let's see whether this is true. Let's draw the force diagram. So if you take the case of a person doing hammer throw, we know that the person is going to experience a force in the outward direction and the hammer is going to experience a force in the inward direction. So same thing here, if you take 
the section of the rope, at this point there is an inward force which you call as T of R because this point is R point. And at the other end of the rope, which is R plus delta R, it experiences an outward, outward force which is T of R plus delta R. Now, if you consider that the, the length of the section is very small, you can treat it as a point object and this point object experiences a radial acceleration which is r omega squared. I hope you remember the acceleration in the case of rotational motion. It has a radial component and tangential component. We are not considering the tangential component at the moment, so only radial component is there. Since this is a circular motion, ra radius is a constant, so r double dot is going to be zero. So acceleration is minus r theta dot square. Theta dot is angular velocity omega, so this is minus r omega square. Minus indi sign indicates it is an inward acceleration. So we have identified the forces acting and also we have identified the acceleration of the section. So we can straight away write down the equation of motion. So remember right hand direction is the positive direction. So the total force acting on the segment of rope is T of R plus delta R minus T of R. This is equal to M into A. M is delta M and A is minus R omega square. Substitute for delta m, this is equal to minus m r omega square by L into delta r. Now you can divide either side of this equation with delta r and take the limiting case delta r tending to 0, meaning the length of the segment is very very small. That's how we are able to approximate it as a point mass, right? So when you take this limit, limit delta r tends to 0, t of r plus delta r minus t of r divided by delta r, this is nothing but dt by dr, right? This is the differential calculus. So this is equal to on the right hand side, since I divide this with delta r, I have minus m r omega square divided by l or dt equal to minus m omega square by l r into dr. So this is the tension acting on a, a small segment of the rope whose length is dr. Now I am interested in calculating the total tension so I do an integration, integration from t0 to tr dt. What is t0? t0 is the tension at the starting point where r equal to 0 and tr is the tension at the point So integral t0 to tr dt equal to minus integral 0 to r m omega square l r dr. Remember even though you are doing integration on either side, the integrating variable is different. So correspondingly you have to choose the limiting value. So here integration is from t0 to tr. On the right hand side since integration is with respect to r, the integrating limits are from 0 to r. So m omega square l is a constant, take it outside, so you have minus integral r dr. So apply the limits, you get tr minus t0 equal to minus m omega square by l into r square by 2 or t of r equal to t0 minus m omega square by 2 l into r square. So this is the expression for tension at a point r. Now the question is, can you calculate the value? So mass of the rope you know, length you know, the angular velocity you can measure and the point at which you are making the measurement that also you know. But T0 is an unknown parameter. This is an unknown constant associated with the integration. Now there are two things which help us to find out the value of unknown constants in integration. One is known as an initial condition and another one is known as boundary condition. So if you are dealing with uh, differential equations with respect to time, like the case of uh, harmonic oscillator equation d square x by dt square plus omega square x equal to 0, here differential is with respect to time, right? So in such cases you can use an initial condition. You specify at time t equal to 0, this is the condition. 
So using that condition, you can calculate the value of the unknown constant. On the other hand, if you are dealing with a temporal equation, like derivative with respect to space, like d square by d d square f by d x square, or like our case dt by dr. Here, derivative is with respect to space, right? In such cases, you can use a boundary condition. So you can say at r equal to 0, this is one of the boundaries, right? Or r equal to l, this is the other boundary, right? At two of these extreme points, you can specify a condition and using that, you can calculate the value. So since we are talking about a spatial equation, I will use a boundary condition. From our previous example, we know that at the end of the rope, the tension is going to be zero because this is the free end, right? So we can use the same thing here. We have the end of the rope being free in our case here as well. So we know that at this point, the tension is zero. But in terms of r, when r equal to l, the tension is 0. So, t of l equal to 0. Now, in this expression, now you can replace r with l, you get t of l. So, t of l is going to be t naught minus m omega square divided by 2l into l square, which is t naught minus half m omega square l, this is equal to 0. And this I can get t naught equal to half m omega square l. Once I know the value of t naught, I can put it back into this equation. So I have t of r equal to half m omega square l minus m omega square by 2l into r square. So half m omega square l is the common factor. Take it outside, you get t of r equal to m omega square by 2l minus multiplied by l square minus r square. So once again, tension is not a constant. As r varies, this is also going to vary. So, so that's why we said if the string is accelerating, the tension varies along the string. Now, one of the instruments used to change the direction of a rope is a pulley. A pulley system is very common in classical mechanics. So when the direction of the rope changes, what happens to the tension? Let's analyze that. So imagine that you have a string with constant tension T, which is deflected through an angle 2 theta naught by a smooth fixed pulley. What is the force on the pulley? So this is the rope, there is a uniform tension T, T is constant throughout the rope, rope is bent through an angle 2 theta naught here. Now what is the force on the pulley? Now we know that the tension here is going to act in the, uh, the downward direction. How does that happen? Take any of this uh, tension, so let's take the tension on the right hand side, since this is at an arbitrary angle, I can decompose this into a horizontal component and a vertical component, right? So here also I can decompose this into a horizontal component and a vertical component. If you look at the horizontal components, they are in the opposite direction, so these two will cancel. On the other hand, the vertical component, they are along the same direction. So these two will add. Now, if this angle is theta naught, this is going to be theta naught and this angle is going to be 90 minus theta naught. Now you can calculate what is the vertical component. This is going to be T cos 90 minus theta naught, which is T sine theta naught. So you have 2t sine theta naught acting in the downward direction. So the total tension of the string or the force of the string onto the pulley is going to be in the downward direction. So what will be the, the force exerted by the pulley onto the rope? It will be in the upward direction, right? That's what Newton's law says. So without uh, solving the equation of motion, we got the value, the force on the pulley is 2t sin theta naught. So this is 
simply by following the geometry. Now let's do a more systematic analysis and arrive at the same result. So once again, uh, it's difficult to analyze the entire system at once. So what we do, we choose a small section, find out what are the forces acting on it, write down the equation of motion, solve it. Then either you can do a summation or an integration and calculate the, the total value for the entire system. So let's choose the section of string between theta and theta plus delta theta. So this is the small section we are talking about. And as I said, the total tension on the string is going to act downward and the total force exerted by the pulley onto the rope that is going to act in the upward direction. Okay, So delta F be the upward force due to the pulley. Delta F acts in the upward direction. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, the tension in the string is constant, but when we decompose it into horizontal and vertical component, we have seen that even though the horizontal components cancel, the vertical components do not cancel, right? So, the, 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 since the elements are not parallel, so you are going to have a non-zero force acting in the downward direction. Now, let's take the limit delta theta tends to zero. So what's the meaning of delta theta tends to zero? When delta theta decreases, the length of the line segment is going to decrease and we can approximate this section to a point mass, right? That's how we will be able to apply Newton's laws. Okay. So once you have a point mass, now you can uh, draw the force diagram. We know that the force of the pulley delta F is acting in the upward direction. Then I have tension towards this direction and tension towards this direction. And if you follow the geometry, if this angle is delta theta, this angle between the, the horizontal and the tension is going to be delta theta by two. Now let's take one of these tension vectors. This angle is a delta theta 2 theta by 2. I can decompose it into a horizontal component and a vertical component. And as you can notice, the vertical component is T sine theta delta theta by 2. I have two such vertical components in the downward direction, right? So the, what are the forces acting? I have delta F acting in the upward direction, which is the positive direction and 2T sine delta theta by 2 acting in the negative downward direction. So the total force is going to be delta F minus 2T sine delta theta by 2, which is equal to F is equal to Ma. What is the acceleration? There is no net vertical movement of the rope, right? So the acceleration is zero. So Right hand side equal to 0. So delta F equal to 2 T sine delta theta by 2 and if delta theta is very very small I can approximate sine delta theta by 2 to delta theta by 2. Remember sine 0 is 0. So if the angle is very very small sine of the angle is same as the angle itself. right? So sine delta theta by 2 equal to delta theta by 2. So substitute it in this equation, you get delta F equal to 2T delta theta by 2. So 2, 2 cancel, you have T delta theta. So the element exerts an inward radial force of magnitude T delta theta on the pull. So once again, let's put things into perspective. I have an element, a small section of the rope, which I approximated to a point mass, which exerts a force T delta theta in the inward direction. Now, if you take the, the Cartesian coordinates X and Y, this radial vector I can decompose into an X component, horizontal component and a Y component, a vertical component. Okay. If you follow the geometry, you can see the component along the x direction is going to be T delta theta cos theta. 
So this is about one small section of the rope. So if you consider all the sections of the rope, the total force in the x direction is going to be summation over t delta theta cos theta. But it's difficult to count each of the elements because the string is a continuous entity. So it makes more sense to do an integration instead of a summation, right? Because an infinite summation is nothing but an integration. So when you do integration, instead of delta theta, we take the continuous element d theta. And what are the limits of the integral? Look at our original geometry. I have plus theta naught in the right direction and minus theta naught in the left direction. So my limits of integral is going to be from minus theta naught to plus theta naught p cos theta d theta. This is the total force in the x direction. p is a constant, take it outside the integral. Integration of cos theta is sin theta. You apply the limits, you get 2t sin theta naught as we have predicted using the the geometry, right? So this is how you take into account the contact forces while analyzing a classical mechanical system. So in the next class, we will discuss about other two types of contact forces, namely the, the frictional force as well as the viscous force. That's for today. Thank you.